Well, we've been in a series called Disruption. This is the last week, our fourth week in it, so we're closing it out today. I'm very excited to close it off and, and end it. Who has liked the series so far, Disruption? Have, yeah, yeah, it's been great just looking at Paul's life and just seeing kind of the disruption that took place in his life, right? And everything that happens after that, as, as we've been talking about just the, the scenarios that he ran into when, when Jesus shone down on the Damascus Road, right? We went through all of that stuff, just the incredible life of Paul, but that didn't come without disruption. It didn't come with, without some pain, right, that he went through. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but as we've been in this four-week series, last week, uh, again, this is the last week, we, we're talking about disruption and how that will take place in our lives, right? Thinking about 2019, we started at the beginning of the year for a reason, saying, hey, no matter what happens this year, we know there's going to be disruption that takes place, regardless. There will be disruption that gets in the way, things that happen that we don't have any control over, but I'm saying, how will we respond? That's the question we've been asking every week. How are we going to respond to the situation? How are we going to respond to the disruption that takes place? I hope well, right? At the very beginning, I said, as I was studying for this series, there was disruption that took place in my home. My furnace broke, and again, and there was the joke of why does the furnace always break in the middle of winter? I was like, why is that? And then I realized that's the only time we use it, right? And so that was funny. It was a joke on me. Thanks, Mike. But the point is, <laughs> the point is that disruption takes place, right? How will we respond? I responded horribly. The Lord showed me and said, you need to grow in this area. Stop being mad about it. Seize an opportunity. And I saw it as an opportunity to grow in my, those scenarios, right? So I'm very honest and open all the time with you guys. That's what took place in my own life. But I believe every disruption leads to an opportunity. And my hope is as we close this thing out that you guys would agree with me that that's absolutely true. That no matter the disruption that takes place, there is an opportunity that lies there that we can grab a hold of and run with it. So three weeks ago, we asked this question. What does disruption do to us? I said two things, right? If you were taking notes, if you aren't taking notes, take notes now. I'll give you some, some things along the way. But what does disruption do to us? Us. One, it leads us away from God. Sometimes, right, because we get bitter, angry, upset. We say, this is the situation that took place. It's because of you, God, that it happened. So we, we turn into bitterness and anger, and we cast the blame onto him and say, it's all your fault. Anyone ever been there? I'm going to put my arms up and my feet up. Thank you for those that were very honest. The rest of you, we're, we're marking those things. Just kidding. Just kidding. It leads us away from God, or it leads us closer to God, right? So we get closer to God in the midst of disruption. Why? Because many of us, we see it and we go, Lord, I need you. I need you. And so that's amazing, right? When we have humility and we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, I need you desperately. So we want to focus on the opportunity in the midst of a disruption. And I gave you this every single week. It's you're never more teachable than in the midst of disruption. Can you guys say teachable? Teachable. You're never more teachable than in the midst of a disruption. And I gave you three things. Number one, God never wants you to stop growing. That's absolutely true. He never wants you to stop growing. Number two, you grow most in the midst of a hardship and or change. And number three, your growth depends on your ability to embrace the disruption. And as we saw Paul, he embraced it last week, right? So your growth depends on that. Two weeks ago, we looked at Paul's past and I asked, how teachable are you? Are you actually teachable? Just because you've known the word for so long or you know this is the way it is or this is how it happens, are you actually teachable and listening to the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit can give you something completely new when you read the Bible again. And so we need to be teachable and listening and hearing from God's word. And so again, I said, how teachable are you? Paul thought he was right. He thought he was right where he needed to be. He thought he knew everything, right? As a Pharisee, everyone wanted to be like Paul. He was taught by the biggest rabbi of that day. It's like a celebrity rabbi that he was hanging with, right? He was the rabbi that looked completely cool. He had the cool clothes on. Everyone wanted to be this guy. And Paul was right next to him being taught by him. And everyone looked at Paul and said, I want to be like that. So he thought he knew everything though. But what was awesome is we see that his humility that takes place when he's on the Damascus Rose as Jesus speaks to him and says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Jesus in that moment identifies with us. As Saul, right, is the one persecuting people, persecuting Christians, and Jesus shows up and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
and immediately Paul's response, Saul's response was incredible. So I, I mentioned this a, a week ago as well. I said, we are all willing to see and be a part of radical change around us. I think that's absolutely true, right? Uh, many of you would probably agree with me and say, yeah, I want to see radical change in the valley. I want to see radical change in the world, right? We want to see those things take place. But I also said this, but are you willing to see radical change in you? It's easy to say, I want to see radical change across the globe. Yes, Lord. I want to see radical change in Utah. I want to see radical change across the globe. But are you willing to actually see radical change in yourself? Because that takes being teachable. That takes being humble. That takes accepting what the Lord has for you. And actually listening to the Holy Spirit. Listening to what God has to say. So are we willing to see radical change in us? I hope the answer is yes. And in those disruptions we see the opportunity. And that opportunity leads to radical change. Because we grow in the midst of those things. And last week again we looked at Paul's moment of disruption. The big thing that took place in Paul's life. We saw again... Saul, when I say Saul, I mean Paul, you guys know that. When Saul responds on the road, we see his heart. We see his humility. We see that he says, yes, Lord, what would you have me do? So again, think about that situation. And today, you might, you might face a disruption later today, later this week, later this month, later this year. And the response is what matters. Where is your heart going to be when, when that disruption takes place? Where is it going to be? And how will you respond? Because it's very important and it shows your true heart in it. So the response should be, yes, Lord, what would you have me do? Even in the midst of this chaos, we don't focus on the chaos. We focus on the instruction. We focus on the opportunity. And we focus on, Jesus, what would you you have me do in this situation. Amen, church? Amen. We want to see that in our own lives. So we saw not only Paul's and Saul's heart, we saw Jesus's heart for us. Again, as I mentioned, he identifies with us. And he also says this, which I love, is he's having a conversation, again, with Ananias as we see that text. That he's not, he's not focused on our past and that our past does not define our future. And I love that. I love that because so many times the enemy wants to bring up the past. He wants to bring us wh what you did before, right? All of those things, all the sins that you've committed, everything that's gone on in your life. He wants to drill that into your mind and say, you can't do things for Christ or you can't do things for the kingdom. Or how are you going to help that person? Look at the past and look what you've done. Jesus shows up to Ananias as Ananias brings up Saul's past and goes, are you kidding me, Lord? Do you know what this guy has done? <laughs> Killed people. Put Christians in prison martyred people, stoned people. And Jesus says, go. Go get him. Because why? Because I'm going to have him teach in front of Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. He's my child. Wow. It's mind-blowing. And in that moment, this is what he's saying. Your past does not define your future. So you might be walking in thinking of the things of your past and going, I can't serve on a team. I can't do this for the Lord. I can't do this. Jesus wiped away those sins for a reason. He died on the cross for your sin and rose again for a reason. Amen. He paid for all of that, past, present, and future. And so do not let the past define your life now. God wants to radically change you and he has a future for you. And so we see that in, in, in Saul's life as he says, yes, Lord, what would you have me do? And we know what takes place, right? As, as he then is blind for three days, he doesn't eat, and then Ananias shows up, and then thus Paul's future begins. So this week we will look at what becomes of Saul, now known as Paul as we continue on in the text, right? As, as after he allows disruption to take place in his life, he sees the opportunity in it, and he grabs a hold of it, and he immediately runs. He runs. Because I, I believe he sees what he's done in the opposite direction, right? And it's amazing the passion that he had. The passion that he had as a Pharisee. The passion that he had for Jewish law. Right? That passion that he had for religion. And Jesus is like, oh, I got something good for this guy. He's so passionate. And that's what we need today. Is passionate Christians talking about Jesus. Passionate Christians loving like Jesus. Not casting blame. Not casting all of these things against someone just because they don't believe the same thing as you. Love them like Jesus. If you're the only Bible they see, hello, that's a great opportunity. So let's love people the way that we're supposed to. But we see Paul's future. If you're with me, turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. 
We're going to be in the, roughly the same text, and then we're going to move forward. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 15. If you've got your phone, iPad, whatever it is, bring it out. Let's read this together. Again, as Ananias brings up Saul's past, we're going to see again Jesus' response in verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Let's keep that very clear. Let's understand that text because we're going to see what takes place as he will do these things, but he also will suffer many ways for the kingdom of God. In verse 17, it says, And Ananias went his his way and entered the house and laying hands on him he said brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit so get this number one it's amazing to see as Ananias is arguing right with God he's arguing having a conversation saying I don't want to do this are you serious and then he finally says no go and what's amazing is this Ananias be mindful Saul's blind at this point Saul's completely blind. And Ananias prays over him and he receives his sight again. What an amazing miracle. He doesn't talk, it just reads over it. It's just like, yeah, he shows up, prays over him, sights there. Like, this is mind-blowing stuff. And it's just like, it, let's just move on. Like, this is amazing to see the miracles that take place. As his sight is now, he has sight again. What a beautiful thing. And, and I'm sure Ananias being blown away as well. But in verse 18, Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and he was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus, and in verse 20, we'll end here for the moment, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. That shows us his past doesn't define his future. The minute this took place, right? The scales fell. He strengthened himself and immediately he went out and started preaching the gospel, the true gospel. And can you imagine the people that were around there? What? <laughs> wait, wait, a second ago, three days ago, however long ago, you were preaching against us, wanting to kill us and wanting to capture us. And now you're preaching about Jesus? That's radical change in an instant. In an instant. And that obviously can take place in our own life. So what's, what's amazing here again, he says the scales fell from his eyes and now he can see. This is an amazing picture of what Jesus does with us. An amazing picture. The minute we are saved from our sin, joined with Christ, it's like those scales that fall off our eyes. That once we saw it this way or we thought religion was like this or it's supposed to be like this, but that was the scales on our eyes. When we realize who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, those scales fall off and we realize the true king and who Jesus is. So it's a beautiful picture of our relationship with Christ when that took place. Maybe the massive disruption in your life was when Jesus radically changed your life. That that was massive disruption because you think differently, you see differently, you talk differently, you act differently. Why? Right? Because the Holy Spirit starts to work inside of you and things start to radically change. And that's an amazing thing because I know many of us can look at our past and go, man, I'm so glad I'm here. So glad I'm here. And not only that, I'm thankful for what God's done. But we're not scared of that because of the future that's ahead and what God has for us. So those scales fall off. We can see clearly. We can see our sin clearly. And we know this, that Jesus loves us. He pours out his grace for us. He pours out his mercy for us. What an incredible thing. And in Psalms 146, 8, it says this, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. I love that it's just saying the Lord is the one that reveals those things to us. He opens our eyes for us that are blind. He lifts us up for those that are weighed down. Those that are weighed down. When it's talking about being weighed down, that's the sin that weighs us down, right? That's the, the things of our past that weigh us down. It's saying the Lord is the one that will raise you up. Remember last week we talked about those things, humility? It's saying you don't need to be on your high horse like Saul was as he's riding in the Damascus road going, I'm doing what I'm supposed to. Everyone wants to be me. Look what I've done for the kingdom of God is what he's thinking. And Jesus shows up. He puts him right off that high horse. And he says, no, Saul, I got something better for you. But first, you need to be humbled. And humbling, isn't that amazing? Don't you guys love to be humbled? <laughs> Let's be honest for one second. Don't we love to be humbled? 
We may absolutely hate it at times, but it's truly what we need. Amen, church? We need it. So the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are weighed down. The Lord loves the godly. And in verse 20, as we see again, immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard, here's what happened. Then all who heard were amazed and said this, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bond to the chief priests? So Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Christ. So we see the response that takes place. As he's saying immediately, he preaches the gospel. He wasn't waiting around for something. So many times I feel like as Christians, we're waiting for something. What are we waiting for? There's nothing to wait. Jesus has given us everything. It's here. Go. Just go and preach the gospel wherever you are. I say this all the time. You don't need a platform. You don't need, you know, all the guitars and all the mics and those things. We need you. We need you. Jesus is saying, go. Go preach the gospel. Let's change the world together. This needs to be us. Again, there's no time to wait. There's no, I, I've heard this from many of my friends growing up or, or many that I've talked to from my past. They say, well, I'm just waiting until I have a family to go back to church. I'm just waiting till this age to go back to church. I want my 20s and 30s to be wild. And then I'll go back to God. Right? It's like they, they choose this idea of, of, I'll go do these things, then I'll have a relationship with God. Or I'll wait because of X, Y, and Z, then I'll have a relationship with God. I'm like, are you kidding? You're missing out on so many blessings. You're missing out on growth. And you're wasting time. There's no point for it. And so Saul, we see here, doesn't waste any time. He runs straight for the Lord and starts preaching the gospel. And we don't want to miss out on these things. Or the opposite, maybe, or I, I don't want to talk uh, because of what others may think of me. Or because they know my past, I don't want to tell them how radically changed I am because they won't believe me. Or they won't see it. Or they'll bring up those things and say, yeah, really, you're a Christian? Look at what you did. But Paul responded to that exact same thing. Maybe that's you, or you, you have a life that you've, you've seen radical change in your life. You've given your life over to Jesus in the last couple years, six months, whatever it is. And people are like, yeah, okay, you're a Christian, really? And you're like, yeah, God's working on my heart. God's working on me, right? And so you don't need to be discouraged by those things because just like Saul, what did they say? Is this not the one who wanted to destroy those who called on the name of the Lord? in Jerusalem, so that he might bring them bound. Isn't his purpose to being here in Damascus that reason? They brought it up. Look at Paul's response. But Saul increased all the more in strength. <laughs> Did he let it affect him at all? No. He took it, received it, and said, okay, I'm going to keep running even harder because I'm going to show you who Jesus the Christ is. It strengthened him. He got excited about it. He was passionate. It's like that gave him more power to keep going. It's like he received it and said, no, that gave me more strength. I'm going to continue proving that Jesus is the Christ. No matter what anyone says, I'm going to keep running. And so you don't need to let those things discourage you. He was strengthened. This adversity pushed him further towards the kingdom of God. He saw it as, guess what? An opportunity. An opportunity to grow. He saw it as an opportunity to keep going, an opportunity to not back down, to stand firm, and to continue sharing what Jesus has done. Can you imagine, again, the scenario? They know who he is. And he has this radical story about what took place recently. He saw him. He had a conversation with Jesus. And so, again, I'm sure the people are like, what is going on? But Saul continues to preach about Christ. And here's what happens. In verse 23. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Listen to that. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates uh, day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Look, they, they got him out of there. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Listen to that. They're all afraid. What's going on? Saul, we know who you are. Why are you here? And they did not believe that he was a disciple. They didn't even believe him. 
Here's this radical story, and the disciples don't even believe him. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at, the, at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at, at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Then the churches, listen to this. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Spirit, guess what? They were multiplied. Amen. Amen. Multiplied. And Saul had a huge part of this as the multiplication began. Can you imagine as Saul shows up with the disciples and the disciples see the passion inside this man for the gospel. The passion they see in him. I guarantee you that lit a fire inside of them once again. All, all new fire. And they are preaching. And all of a sudden you see multiplication across the board. Multiplication in churches. People giving their life to Christ. Radical change takes place. Disruption takes place. And people see the opportunity in them. And you see growth take place in the church as a whole. What an amazing story as we see again Saul's life and the passion he has. And again, even the people, disciples who know Jesus, were saying, no, we don't believe this guy at all. He definitely can't be what he says he is. He, this, these things that took place did not happen. But again, I love how Jesus brings Barnabas aside of him and says, no, this is true. I saw him preaching about Jesus in Damascus in Jesus' name. And guess what? We're going to do mighty and powerful things for the gospel. And we see it. That again, the churches now were multiplied and we see amazing things take place. The churches continued. They multiplied. People are getting saved all over the place. Paul saw the opportunity in the midst of that disruption. Guess what? He was teachable. He was humble. When hardship came or adversity, he grew in his faith. His perspective was right. Because he didn't focus on the chaos. He didn't focus on the people causing issues. He didn't focus on the people speaking against him. He kept focusing on Jesus, rightfully so, and kept running after the kingdom of God. And so we need to do the same thing. Because guess what? Hardship will come. It will absolutely come. Disruption will hit us. But we have to see the opportunity that lies within that. Again, hardship came, adversity came, he grew in his faith. When they said, no, isn't this this guy? We don't want him around. It strengthened him to continue on. His perspective was right. He was focused on Jesus. He was focused on the kingdom and he was being kingdom minded. But as, as, we, took a, as we end here, the point is to look at Paul's journey now, right? Paul's future. As we see the radical, ch radical change in Paul, as we see the things that took place, as he was strengthened in his faith, and he continues to preach the gospel, he then goes on this amazing journey to, to preach about Jesus. He didn't just accept the disruption but to allow him to grow, but guess what? He became a disruptor. He became a disruptor. And if you're taking notes, that's the point today. Become a disruptor. How else will we change the world? How else are we going to change the world? We have to disrupt the culture. We have to disrupt what's going on. We have to show people who Jesus is and what he has for their life. And not be afraid of it. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. That's powerful stuff. I was having a conversation with somebody recently and we're, we're chatting and he brought up a good point. He's like, man, I don't see God in, in our times anymore. Just like the Old Testament or those things that take place. And I go, you know what the truth is? It's because in America we're not desperate. We have everything. Go to Africa. Go to Asia. People are getting healed every single day. Every single day it's taking place. The blind are seeing. The lame are walking. And we say, where's God? He's here. But are you willing to see radical change? Guess in who? You. Are you willing to see the radical change in your life? God is here and he's in this place. But Paul's journey again, he didn't just accept the disruption to allow him to grow. He became a disruptor for the kingdom of God. Paul goes on and continues to preach Jesus all over the place. He starts churches. He builds leaders. He pours into communities. He pours into people. He disrupts culture, completely flipping culture upside down. He does it. Obviously by God's strength, he brings hope to the people who desperately need it.
I'm going to give you a quick overview really quick of what Paul's journey looked like. After his conversion on the Damascus Road, he spends several years in Arabia. Then he returns to Damascus. He preaches about Jesus. He then flees Damascus because of persecution. He visits Jerusalem and meets up with other apostles. Did you read some of this? He then preaches in Tarsus in the surrounding region. Then another apostle invites him to teach in Antioch, modern day Turkey. With Barnabas, he visits Jerusalem again. He's going all over the place. Then he starts his mission trip. So that's all local stuff. That's all local stuff. Changing the world right where he is. So people say, I want to change the world. Start here. Why do you need to go outside this place? There's hundreds of thousands of people dying that need hope. Start here. You don't need to go on a mission trip. All good. I love it. Let's go. I'm into those things. There's a mission right where you're sitting. And we want to see radical change take place. Then he starts his mission trips, first to Cyprus, then Galatia, then the, the Asia Minor area. During that time, Paul argues with the Gentile Christians about following Christ, not following Jewish law. Another mission takes place, Silas. He goes with Silas through Asia Minor and Greece. He settles in Corinth. While there, he writes letters to the Thessalonians. Then he heads to Ephesus and stays there. He writes Galatians. He writes Corinthians. Then he travels through Greece and possibly modern Yugoslavia. Writes Romans during that point. And after all this, he returns back to Jerusalem and he gets arrested and in prison. Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament. This guy who killed Christians, who martyred them, who stoned them, who put them in prison. He wrote almost half this book that you're reading in the back of the Bible. Talk about an amazing future. And Jesus is not focused on his past. So he writes all these things on this amazing journey. He comes back to Jerusalem. He gets arrested and imprisoned at Caesarea. He appears in, in front of Festus, a ruler at the time. There's a conversation that takes place. He says, no, I want to appeal to Caesar. He appeals to Caesar. He heads to Rome under arrest and he writes more letters to the Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. Then later, he writes to Timothy and Titus on, his, on another journey to possibly Spain. He returns back to Rome as a, as a later time, and then guess what? He's martyred. Look what took place in his life. Radical things. And he disrupted every culture he went to. Spent time with them. Built leaders. Established churches. Poured into young leaders. Young. They say Timothy was probably a teenager. Yeah. Teenager. Yeah. Establishing a church and preaching the gospel. Yeah. You know what that tells you? Everyone can be used by God. Amen. Eight, seven, five, mm -hmm. eighty. Doesn't matter. Amen. God wants to use you right where you are. And we see that in Paul's life as he's pouring into these leaders and all these things that take place in his life. Then again, he returns back to Rome, later is martyred. History strongly suggests that he was beheaded. And I can guarantee this, that while he's probably being beheaded, he has a smile on his face. And he's probably preaching the gospel as they are beheading him. It's brutal stuff. People say, the Bible's boring. What? What? There's all kinds of things that take place that are definitely not boring. <laughs> this guy was beheaded. And again, I guarantee the gospel is flowing out of his mouth as it's taking place. Or he's probably praying for them. We don't know. We're not 100% sure. But why do I bring all these things up? Because guess what, church? Paul was just a man. A human. That's it. Obviously, the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But he, let me tell you this. As he's just a man, history would tell us that he wasn't even good looking. <laughs> wasn't even good looking. We don't really know what he looked like. There's not many things in the word of God that tell us. There was a book that was written in the second century AD that's called Acts of Paul. And in there, they say this from history. They say this about him. He was small, bald-headed, bow-legged, <laughs> Well built, with eyebrows that met. That means he had a unibrow. <laughs> he had a unibrow. 
small, bald-headed, had a unibrow, rather long-nosed, but I love the last part they say of him, and full of grace. Wow. Wow. And I love that they add that in there too. It's a nice way to end it, right? <laughs> nice way to say all these things about him and then they go, but he was full of grace. <laughs> but guess what? His stature, his looks, none of that mattered. It didn't matter. Because when people heard him speak, they were radically changed because of the passion that was inside of him. Amen. Because of the radical change that took place in his life. And for some of you, you have a crazy past. I'm saying, talk about it. Talk about it. It's okay because that shows the radical change that took place in your life the minute Jesus disrupted everything. Amen. You don't need to be afraid of those things. Why be afraid of it? Paul wasn't. He left it as is. He knew what people thought about him. He knew what he had done. But he said, I'm going to leave all of that behind. I'm going to focus on the kingdom of God because he says he has radical things in store for me. And the same to you. He has radical things in store here in this valley, here in Salt Lake County, that we can change culture. We can change lives. That people can radically, those scales can fall off people's eyes and they can truly see who Jesus is. But it starts with us. It starts here. If we want to see radical change, we have to pray for it. We have to ask for it. We have to be preaching boldly in this place. And not be scared of the past. Not be scared of what people will think. None of that. But be focused on the kingdom of God. Again, this man was passionate, full of grace, full of joy. And he wanted to proclaim Jesus. He proclaimed at all cost. But guess what? It was not easy. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians... We'll see a little bit of how easy it was. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, Paul speaking, he says this, Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Listen to that. 39 lashes. They say that can kill a man. And how many times did he go through that? Five different times. For the sake of the gospel, he kept just receiving it. You'd think by everything we already read, we're like, this guy should have been dead many times. But he continued, three times I've been beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Listen to this. I was reading this the other day and I'm mind blown by this. And I'm going to bring it up. He says, once I was stoned. Here's what's so interesting about this, this, this scenario. The Jewish people knew how to stone people, right? They did this on a daily basis. They killed people this way. But what's so interesting is in the text that he's speaking about when he's saying I got stoned. They stoned him. They dragged his body outside the city and they left him. And it says the apostles were surrounding him. That's it. That's all we hear. My question is, what is taking place? Paul has to die. They know what they're doing. They wouldn't stone to just hurt them. They'd stone to kill them. And then later on we see a text where he says, I went up to the third heaven and I saw things that I could not speak about. And he's talking about the stoning that took place. That in that moment, he was in heaven. And he saw things he couldn't even say. I'm mind blown by this. Because the next text, after it says they drug him out, the apostles surround him, it says this. Paul stands up and he walks right back into the city. Are you kidding me? You just got stoned. He gets right up and he walks back into the city. Guess what? The city that he just got stoned in. Why? Because his passion was for people. His passion was for the lost. His passion was to tell about Jesus and all that he's done in his life. And I asked so many questions and I'm reading this. I'm like, God, did he die? Did you resurrect him from the dead? What happened? We don't know. But what's amazing is it didn't stop him. He gets back up. At the next verse, we literally read that. Verse by verse. He's stoned, dragged out in the city. The apostles surround him. Next verse, he gets back up and he walks back into the city. I am mind blown as I read that text. And the passion continues. And radical things take place even after that. 
three times I was shipwrecked. Have any of us been shipwrecked? I mean, this is crazy stuff. Shipwrecked. Most people don't survive that. Three times it took place in his life. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I can't even imagine that. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I have been hungry and thirsty and often have gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden. Listen to his heart here. He's saying, look at all these things I've been through. Then besides all this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. He says, forget all of those things. Every single day I do this. Why? Because I'm passionate about people. I'm passionate about Jesus. I'm passionate about radical change. I'm saying this morning, church, let's become disruptors just like Paul did. Let's become disruptors just like him. As he went, it didn't matter. He cared for people so much that he was willing to be shipwrecked. He accepted that disruption in his life. He saw it as an opportunity. He loved people so much that five times he was lashed with the 39 lashes. Think about it. He had so much passion for people, he got stoned. And many, many other things that took place in his life. Then besides all this, I have daily burden of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? Listen to this point in, in verse 30. But if I must boast, I would rather boast about the things that show how weak I am. He's saying, if you want to boast about anything, boast about how weak you are. Because guess what? When you're weak, you're strong in Christ. That's humility. And Paul says it at, at its finest. It's humility. But, it, but again, as he's saying all these things, Jesus spoke about Paul's future. Jesus spoke about this and what would take place. And Acts 9 is, again, is he speaking to Ananias? Let's bring it up again. He says this to Ananias, Go! For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, to bear my name before kings, and to bear my name in front of the children of Israel. He did all of those things. Speaking to Gentile Christians about how they should, should not follow Jewish law but follow Christ. He was then in, appears in front of Festus and appears to Caesar. The one ruling everything. He was able to preach and speak in front of him. And guess what? Jesus called it. He said he's a chosen vessel because you have no idea what's in store for this guy, Ananias. We're going to flip culture upside down. And we're going to do it with, guess what, 11, 12 men? That's it? There's probably 50, 60 people in this room right now. Think about what we can do for the gospel. Think about what we can do for a culture. Think about what we can do with a passion, just a little bit of passion, like Paul. We can literally change the world. Completely change it. But we have to be willing to become the disruptor. How else will we change the world? How else? Let's be teachable. Let's be humble people who want to give hope to a dying world. This is you and I. We can speak to kings. We can speak to rulers. We can disrupt culture and we can disrupt religion. We can change the world through Jesus. Billy Graham says this. We are the Bibles the world is reading. We are the creeds the world is needing. And we are the sermons the world is heeding. Think about that. People are looking. And guess what? As it says, we are the Bibles the world is reading. You could be the only Jesus they'll ever see. So why don't we be passionate about the gospel? Why don't we be passionate about Jesus and what he's done? I'm going to say this, church. Let's be world changers. Can we do that? Yeah, let's, do let's be world changers. Let's be disruptors for the kingdom of God. Let's tell the whole entire world who Jesus is and not be afraid of it. Because he's done amazing things in, his, in, in our lives. And Jesus says this, lastly. You will receive power from the Holy Spirit. The same spirit that lived in Christ lives inside of you. And he's saying that same spirit living inside of you, guess what? You'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, and not even that, to the end of the earth. That means everywhere. That means 
everywhere we're going to be able to preach the gospel. Everywhere that we go, every person that we confront, every person we have an opportunity to speak on, we get to share the gospel with them. But that's not it. We get to share hope and eternal life. This is something that's exciting. We should be excited about it. And we should be passionate about it. Can we stand up, church? Before we end with the song, want to ask this if we could bow our heads close our eyes two things number one maybe you've been a Christian for a long time long time or just short whatever it is but you 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 want that passion you're ready to be a world changer you're ready to see disruption and see it as an opportunity to grab hold of it to see radical change take place in your life. Not just say, I want to see change across the globe, but you want to see change in your own heart. That it starts here. It starts now. There's no reason to wait for it. If that is you, where you're just ready, you're just ready to take it on. You're ready to be passionate about the gospel. Not be afraid about talking about Jesus and what he's done. Just raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Amen. We're just going to pray together. Raise your hand if that's you. We just want that fire again, that the, the inside of you. Just go, you know what, Lord? I want that passion that I see in Saul's life. I want that passion where he didn't let anything distract him from the kingdom of God. But he kept running for the sake of the gospel. Amen. Lord, for those that raised their hand, you know their heart. Father, and they're saying, I want to be passionate about the gospel. I want to give it all to you, Lord. I want to see radical things take place in this life. I want to see radical things take place in my family, friends, culture, Lord. Allow me to be a world changer. Allow them to, again, do mighty things in your name. As your word says, we can. As you said yourself, you will do more than what I've done. We want that passion, Lord. Please, Father, stir in our hearts the things that we need. Bring disruption that we'll see opportunities in it grow in, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And number two, as you still have your head bowed and eyes closed, on the opposite side where you have not given your life over to Jesus. You don't, you don't have that real relationship and you're wanting that. That you're wanting to be able to see opportunities in the midst of disruption where you just see it as chaos. And you're like, why, God? When God's going, I got something great for you, son. I got something great for you, daughter. Just listen to me. Accept me. And we're going to do radical things for the kingdom of God. If that is you, you're ready to hand it all over to Christ. Just raise your hand. We're going to go through a simple, simple prayer. Amen. Anyone else? You're ready. It's now. There's no time to wait. Repeat after me and say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Forgive me of those sins, Lord. Father, be my king. Be my everything. Change my heart. Change my life. I believe you rose again. I believe you died for me. And I'm ready to give it all to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we say, amen. Amen, church, amen.